The monograph aims to provide the civil servants, military leaders, the diplomats and the students with an intellectual basis they would need to prepare for further study or for assignments in Afghanistan, a nation that has been on war since last 33 years. With the analysis of the land and its people and by recapping the history of Afghanistan and by assessing the current situation, this work can set a foundation upon which the students and leaders can begin the preparation for specific tasks. It also aims to examine the range of choice for the further U.S. policy towards Afghanistan and to give suggestions for future study. Much of the outline of the recent events will be familiar to many. Just two days before the 9-11 attacks on the United States, the Al-Qaeda operatives, who were posing as journalists, succeeded in the assassination of the commander of Northern Alliance forces named Ahmed Shah Massoud inside his own headquarters in northern Afghanistan. This act could be considered as a favor by Al-Qaeda to the Taliban brothers as a reward for their past rapport and a down payment on the grief that was about to descend on the Taliban from the US and its allies. With the heinous attacks of the 9-9 and 9-11, the American and the Afghan people had been tied together in a common war and rage against the Al-Qaeda along with its fellow, the Taliban. After the bombardment of the U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya in 1998 by the Al-Qaeda, the United States, along with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and others, asked the Taliban to surrender their leader, Osama bin Laden. After their refusal and after the Al-Qaeda's attack on New York, in Pennsylvania and at the Pentagon, the Taliban again refused to give Osama bin Laden along with his accomplices. The United States took a decisive action with the backing of the United Nations Security Council resolution. With the help of the SOF, Special Operations Forces, the CIA operatives and the US air power, along with the support from the Northern Alliance and the Pashtun tribes in the south, they were able to bring down the Taliban forces and chase them all their way into Al-Qaeda allies in Pakistan and Iran. However, both Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar escaped with several subordinates. From 2002 to 2005, a small international and American force tried to help Afghanistan to restore its feet. Only in 2008, after the war in Iraq began to subside, the US was able to focus on the predicament in Afghanistan. The administration of Obama redoubled its US efforts and stepped up its drone attacks against the terrorist leaders and the insurgents. The US military and civilian assets helped in bringing some hope about restoring peace in the area. It was at the same time that the US President Barack Obama declared that he would not support the endless war in Afghanistan. Later, the NATO nations of the Lisbon summit established a target date of the year 2014 for Afghanistan to take charge of its security across the nation. The struggle for independence, modernization and development. During the mid-1700s, Afghanistan became a unified entity with poor and undeveloped status which was located in a very rough neighborhood. The size, shape and degree of the country and the centralized power depended on several leaders. These leaders, like the president of Afghanistan, Karzai, were mostly from the Durrani Confederation of the Southern Pashtuns. These were famous for the martial and rebellious spirit. Their toughest and the biggest rivals were the Gilzai, or the Eastern Pashtuns. In the beginning of 1830s, Afghanistan had to witness two consecutive wars over the issue of the feeble attempts of Russia, which were aimed at gaining influence and in using Afghanistan against the British India, which had the territory of what is now known the modern Pakistan. The Third Anglo-Afghan War was fought after the era of World War I, which was fought for getting independence from the interference of the British with the affairs of Afghanistan. This competition was referred to as the Great Game. The First Anglo-Afghan War, which was fought between 1839 to 1842, was with reference to the blocking of the influence of Russia from the borders of India and the extending of the British influence in Central Asia. The First Anglo-Afghan War began with massive invasion from the British and the toppling of the rule named Dost Mohammed and the occupation of Kabul and other cities. 
After the assassination of the British political agent, the remnants of the first British expeditionary force, which included as many as 16,000 soldiers, camp followers and dependents which tried to retreat back to India. The forces were nearly all dispersed or killed, including thousands of Afghanistan citizens, and also the three cities of Afghanistan were destroyed, including Kabul. It was then that the British withdrew. Dost Mohammed became the ruler again and was designated the title of Shah or Emir in different areas and eras. The ruler now spent the rest of his reign in the consolidation of power with a British subsidy. During the Second Anglo-Afghan War, which happened during 1878 to 1880, the disputes which were over the influence of Russia on Kabul again produced or created the British ultimatum which was deemed to be a successful and rapid invasion. As a result, a murdered British envoy, a troubled occupation and subsequent manoeuvre warfare continued to follow the regime. Abdul Rahman became the ruler or the Emir after getting the Pyrrhic victory for the Greater Britain. In the phrase of Barnett Rubin, a coercion-intensive path to state formation was pursued by Abdul Rahman, who ruled from the centre with a strong iron fist until the moment of his death in 1901. It was Rahman who brought the country together and ruled in an appropriate but harsh manner. He was forced to accept the Durand line, which was drawn by the British envoy named Sir Henry Mortimer Durand. The Durand line was meant to divide India and Afghanistan. The Durand line also divided the Pashtuns and left a third of them in Afghanistan and around two-thirds Western India, which is now the modern Pakistan. As a result of the two wars with British, strong Afghan-British tensions had developed which also led to the increase of Afghanistan's xenophobia. As a result, an issue which was not resolved started over the homeland of the Pashtuns and results in the split of the two countries. During the first two Anglo-Afghan wars, the Afghans managed to earn a well-justified reputation as that of the fierce fighters who had a taste for no-holds-barred atrocities and battlefield behaviours. It was the permission of Kipling that no sane British soldier ever allowed himself to be captured even if wounded. On an interesting note, the leaders of Afghanistan fought against the British enroachment. It was after getting bested or severely vexed in the British for the establishment of independence from them that the Afghans ended up in taking subsidies from them. In return, the British received the control over the foreign policy of the Afghanistan. The main purpose of the subsidies was to strengthen the Afghanistan army and the further strengthening of the internal powers of the central government in Kabul. This was a stable situation which continued until 1919 and won total independence during the Third Anglo-Afghan War. It was followed by a great political paradox in which the rulers of Afghanistan had become the strongest in the nation and was supported by the foreign subsidies. No or low subsidies refer to the fact that a tax had to be snatched out from the locals and at times it was to be carried out with harsh conscription. These measures were not famous and irrelevant. The citizens were eager to salute and respect the national rulers, but they were not ready to have themselves interfered by the local authorities or government. World War I followed the Third Anglo-Afghan War and Afghanistan could establish full independence after that. The independence also resulted in the mysterious death of the current ruler, or emir, named Habibullah, who did not wish for another war with Britain, as it would have cost him a good amount of subsidy. Habibullah had ruled in utter peace for almost two decades and had maintained a neutral state in Afghanistan during the World War I. As per the reports of the historians, the new Amir, Amanullah, who was the third son of Habibullah and had seized power from the claims of the stronger dynasties, was responsible for the death of his father. He wanted to have a great showdown with the British. The Third Anglo-Afghan War had just a few battles. Even then, the British managed to make use of the biplanes to bombard Kabul and Jalalabad. The British, who were war-weary, however, gave in to the demands of the Afghan leaders soon, which demanded full independence. With the war, it brought an end to the British subsidies, which were the key source of revenue for the leaders of Afghanistan and also for the Afghan sovereignty of the enroachment of the Great Britain. 
After Afghanistan won the Third Anglo-Afghan War and gained independence, it was marked as the beginning of the self-rule of Afghanistan. It was then that the Ami Amanullah decided to bring about the modernization of his kingdom. He became the first Afghan ruler to take military assistance and aid from the Soviet Union. He made announcements of several reforms and even brought down the few revolts predictably in the eastern region over conscription, taxation and various social changes which included the education of women in the country. After a few years, Amanullah made a tour of Europe for a few months after retreating his most of the objectionable reforms. In the year 1928, he returned from Europe with the notion of becoming the Afghan version of Kemal Ataturk, who was the leader in Turkey and had made it a modern secular state. Amanullah went on to pursue the drastic reforms by the Afghan standards, which were despite the fact that his previous attempts at making reforms had started a revolt in the East. This time, he even went further to remove the veil from women, enabling co-education and even forcing the Afghans to wear the Western style and modern clothing in the capital. He even went on to alienate the conservative clergy, including those who had in the past supported his program of modernization. The civil war of 1929, which was a form of revolt, broke out in Afghanistan as the weakened king was abdicated. It was for nine months that the chaotic Afghanistan was ruled by Habibullah Kalakani, who was also referred to as Bacha Sakao, or the son of the water carrier. He was perceived by many as a Tajik brigand. When Nadir Shah came to the throne, it was then ordered to be restored in the country. Nadir Shah brought back the conservative rule and was assassinated in 1933 by a young man who was seeking revenge for the death of one of his family members. The dynasty of Nadir Shah, which was given the name Musahiban after the family name ruled Afghanistan from 1929 to 1978. After the death of Nadir Shah, his teenage son, Zahir Shah, succeeded him to the throne. Even his ancestral and paternal uncles had only served as the regents until 1953. From the period of 1953 to 1973, Zahir Shah ruled the country along with several prime ministers. The first prime minister was Prince Mohammad Daoud, who was the cousin of the emir. During the reign of Zahir Shah, Afghanistan as a country managed to remain neutral during the time of the World War II. It began to develop on an economical level with the help of the foreign aid and created a modern form of the military with the help of the USSR and therefore managed to stay at an uneasy peace with the neighbouring countries. Even the possible trouble with the newly formed Pakistan, which was home to twice the number of Pashtuns of Afghanistan, was at a constant peace. The Duran line was always an issue and from time and again the famous status of Pashtunistan was replaced formally by the nationalists of Afghanistan who were in demand of a plebiscite. Afghanistan went on to cast the only vote which it had against Pakistan on being admitted to the United Nations in 1947. For the Soviet Union, Afghanistan was highly important. It was a neutral and a developing country which was located on the periphery of the USSR and had beheld Moscow for the military and economic aid, which was supplied generously during the 1970s. Daoud, who was the cousin of the Emir and had served as the Prime Minister from 1953 until the start of the constitutional monarchy in 1964, which was marked as the end of his tenure. The king abraded under the authority of his cousin and has marked it in the constitution that from then onwards no relative of the king would be serving as any minister of the government. The constitutional monarchy, which was a half-hearted attempt at the establishment of the democracy with a parliament but with no political parties, lasted only for a decade until the year 1973. It was when Daoud, who with the help of some of the army officers, had launched a bloodless coup when the Emir Zahir Shah was abroad. Five years later, Daoud, who was also referred to as the Red Prince, was toppled himself in the overthrowing by the leftists who had turned their back to him. Another cycle of fruitless and rapid efforts to modernization followed and was accompanied by the high amount of repression. 
The radical and new heirs of Amanullah were active communists who were completely bereft of the common sense about their own people. A series of events included in the history of Afghanistan during that time with the passing away of Abdul Rahman in 1901 and the advent of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan in 1978. The party continues to exist even today and was woven into contemporary context, was dominated by war, domination, terrorism, radical Islam, globalization and the age of information. The Soul Revolution and the Soviet-Afghan War 1978 to 1989. The period of stability from 1933 to 1978 gave its way to insurrection which was first targeted against the Afghan communists and later resulted in the invading of the Soviet Union. The communist overthrowing and the Soviet invasion went off to 33 years that continues to the present. During the year 1978, the regime of President Daoud approached its fifth year as he began to realize that the leftists had grown strong against his rule. A demonstration began with the mysterious death of an Afghan leftist which alarmed Daoud. He then put the leading members of the PDPA, People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, under house arrest. The leaders of the party called for a coup. The Sour Revolution, which began in April, was an urban coup d'etat, had marked the birth and the origin of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. The PDPA Party of Afghanistan had two different factions named the Kalk Faction and the Parcham Faction. The Kalk Masses Faction had great strength in the security services and was led by Hafizullah Amin and Mohammed Taraki. The Parcham Banner faction was led by Barbak Kamal. After the coup, the relations of PDPA with the United States were not very productive but were still moderate. In February 1979, the relations of US Afghan became nose divide when the radicals in Kabul kidnapped the ambassador of the US named Adolf Spike Dobbs. The rescue attempt on saving the ambassador ended up in killing the kidnappers along with the ambassador. As a result, the aid programs of the US ended and the diplomatic profile of Afghanistan with the US has reduced greatly. In March 1979, the insurgency took a sudden change. A rebel attack was witnessed in the city of Herat, which was coupled with a mutiny of the army and resulted in the massacre of around 50 Soviet officers and the dependents. A leading figure in the attack was the captain of the Afghan army named Ismail Khan, who went on to become the resistance leader and then the regional warlord and then the Karzai cabinet officer. The Afghan army conducted several retaliation attacks in the city of Herat. Throughout the year 1979, the Soviet pilots flew combat missions in the city. A continuous succession of the Soviet generals conducted various assessments that increased the equipment and the advisors. The Soviet leadership, later on, agreed with the assessment until the fall of 1979. The position of the Soviet Union and its strength in Afghanistan and had opened to the Central Asian republics the possible contagion from the local radical Islamists. Hafizullah Amin had shamed the leadership of the Soviet Union and the military condition was getting out of control. All of this came to an end in 1979. It was a period of great change in the international relations of Afghanistan. The Shah of Iran was overthrown and the diplomats of the US were taken hostage by the radical regime in Tehran. A Pakistani mob, which was misguided by the rumours of the involvement of the US in the seizure of a mosque, went on to burn down the American embassy in Islamabad. The invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union in December added great stress to the international relations of the great powers. It was for the first time that the Soviet Union had utilised its powers to attack a nation by violating the Warsaw Pact. This violation of the expectations of the Cold War resulted in another set of a proxy war between the superpowers of the world. The invasion by the Soviet Union in late December 1979 was the result of a well-executed operation. The infiltrated commandos had moved on the palace and killed the Emir Rahman and his colleagues. The paratroopers then seized the bases which were present inside and even outside the country. 
two motorized rifle divisions, which were filled with reservists from the Central Asia republics, out of which one was from Tanets in the north-central region and the other was from Kushka to Makinstan in the west, brought the number of army men or the Soviet troops to around 50,000 by the end of the first week of January 1980. As time passed, the reservists were completely withdrawn and the number of the Soviet troops increased to 130,000 soldiers. The army forces of Afghanistan did not deserve the continued poor performance and moved into high gear. The Soviet forces were not trained for counterinsurgency and lacked recent experience in the mountain warfare and thus did not perform well in the environment of Afghanistan. Later, the Soviets moved in the large-scale operations to make the areas of the strong Mujahideen elements clear. They held areas in the countryside rarely and thus never tried to govern the same in a systematic manner. As a result, the Afghan refugees increased in number, which began with international outrage. The efforts of the Soviet military got hampered by the slow learning efforts of the Soviet armed forces. It was presumed that it would take five years before they started the agile strike operations with airborne forces and the air assaults. The next problem was the international isolation and the major support for the insurgents. The invasion of Afghanistan was considered to be a heinous act. Even the Cuban communists and the Eastern European countries were slow to help out Afghanistan. The United States and China kept their dumb about the criticism. During the administration of the second Reagan, the Mujahideen were offered the shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles which severely affected the Soviet aircraft. The US aid to Mujahideen, which was disturbed by the ISI, Inter-Services Intelligence, Directorate of Pakistan, rose to around $400 million per year. A new age had dawned in the Soviet Union in 1985. A communist reformer by the name Mikhail Gorbachev went on to become the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the leader of the Soviet regime. He was a dedicated communist and had sent out to unwind his program of new thoughts, openness, democratization and the reconstruction of the Soviet Union. The war in Afghanistan fit the transformational agenda of Gorbachev, which supported the phrase of Stalin, like a saddle fits a cow. The Soviet Union quickly moved to the leadership of Afghanistan. Gorbachev gave the Soviet army almost a year to fight in Afghanistan, which proved extra resources and encouraged much experimentation. The USSR supported the reforms in the Afghan army and the Soviet advisers along with the cadres of Najibullah proved quite successful in the last few years of the army in Afghanistan and the organization of the friendly militia groups. Before Afghanistan moved on to the civil war, it was important to deal with the common misperceptions. Some pundits, which included both the Russian and American, observed the United States today in the same boat in Afghanistan as the USSR was during the 1980s and was thus destined to meet the same fate. The United States can be considered as a superpower, but it is not an empire. The US does not occupy the countries or replicate the structure of the American government or the political ideologies for the accomplishments of the long-term goals. In Afghanistan, after it was attacked by the resident terrorists, the United States came to rescue the combatants who were fighting for an unpopular government which was recognized by three countries. The forces of America did not kill any US allies and replaced them with puppets during the invasion of Afghanistan. The Soviet forced over 4 million Afghans into exile as the United States formed conditions wherein the majority of them have returned in the current scenario. The whole nation of Afghanistan was the enemy of the Soviet army and the United States was the coalition partners. As a result, the Soviet Union fought for securing the authoritarian state with an alien ideology as the United States and its allies are still trying to establish a stable state with democratic aspirations where people have a claim on prosperity and have basic freedoms. In the end, the Soviet Union experience in the US cost 15,000 Soviet and around a million lives of the Afghan citizens.
This had created a huge Afghan diaspora and left around millions of mines on the ground and hastened the demise of the Soviet Union. After the departure of the Soviet Union took place in 1989, a civil war continued to the start of the next century. It was the first against the Najibullah regime and then among the Mujahideen groups and then between the groups of the upstart Taliban. After the seizure of Kabul by Taliban during the fall of 1996, it continued to fight the non-Pashtun Mujahideen who reorganized the Northern Alliance. Civil War and Advent of Taliban with the much-expected departure of the Soviet Union and its army in February 1989, it was supposed to mark the end of the war, but it was not so. The regime of Najibullah, which was aided by the Soviet security assistance, went on to build lances around the country. With an army of around 65,000 men and an air force of as many as 200 planes and helicopters and also with well-paid military units, the government forces of Afghanistan were able to hold off the Mujahideen. This fact became much clearer in May 1989 when the city of Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan was attacked by a number of Mujahideen groups but failed to seize the same. The disparate Mujahideen groups, which were dubbed as Peshawar 7, failed to cooperate and even fought among themselves. Najibullah was given full support by the Soviet Union and therefore fought for three years. In March 1992, after the demise of the Soviet Union, Najibullah stopped fighting but he was still unable to leave the country. Therefore, he took refugee in the UN compound, where he remained until he was seized by the Taliban in 1996. Civil Wars, 1992 to 1996. With the help of the United Nations, in 1992, a provisional government was formed in Afghanistan to rule the country. However, it failed due to the constant fights between the Mujahideen members. The conflict was much bitter, particularly between the Pashtun, Hezbi, Islami followers of Gulbuddin Hekmatya, who was supported by Pakistan, and the Tajik fighters of Ahmed Shah Massouds, Jamiat i Islami, who went on to control Kabul. The civil war was characterized by fierce fighting over Kabul, which was occupied Massoud but was desired by Hekmatya and in some other cities as well. From the period of April 1992 to April 1993, much of the capital city of Kabul was destroyed with around 30,000 inhabitants killed and around 10,000 wounded. In Kandahar and various locations, armed robbery, rape, kidnapping of the young boys and other forms of violence had become quite common in Afghanistan. The Rule of the Taliban Having taken control of the overall country and after the implementation of the Sharia-based law and order, the Taliban was puzzled about the running of the government and the management of the economy, which in the end went from bad to worse. This included the UN sanctions for the trafficking of the narcotics and droughts were added to the culture. Public health declined remarkably due to the Taliban-imposed restrictions on the mobility of the female midwives. All of these failures were due to the intimate connection between the Taliban and their practices. They were generally opposed to modernity and progress. In these states of failures, the success of the Taliban was quite predictable and understandable. On the event of taking Kabul, the decrees of the Taliban were among the most repressive public policy. Some of the cardinal elements of the Taliban public policy include Prohibition against music Prohibition against female exposure on any forms. Mandatory prayer. Prohibition against shaving. Prohibition against kite flying. Prohibition against British and American hairstyles. Prohibition against witchcraft. Prohibition against playing drums. Eradication of the use of narcotics. The Ministry of Promotion of Virtue and the Extermination of Sin was quite active. The women who displayed any form of the directives were beaten by the religious police. The public executions for the serious crimes of adulterers were publicized. The Taliban forced the women to wear the burqa. The measures of the Taliban annoyed several Afghans, especially those in the urban areas who had lived a less restricted life. 
In addition to the violation of the human rights, the Taliban also declared war on the forms of art and were aided by their brethren al-Qaeda, who had similar orthodox beliefs. As a result, thousands of, thousands of books were burned. The possession of the Western-style fashion magazines was banned as they were considered as crimes. Even the animals in the Kabul Zoo were killed and tortured by the Taliban file and rank. The domestic policies were quite heinous, and the worst aspect of the Taliban governance was the virtual adoption of the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization. Osama bin Laden came back to Afghanistan in 1996, just before Taliban overtook Kabul. He fought there for a short while with the Mujahideen during the Soviet war. Osama saw Afghanistan as the first state in the new Islamic Caliphate. In Afghanistan, bin Laden set up training camps for Taliban recruits and the Al-Qaeda members. Around 20,000 foreign and Afghan recruits have passed through the camps. On 7th of August 1998, Al-Qaeda carried out bombardments on the embassies of the US in Kenya and Tanzania in East Africa. In 1999, the 9-11 plotters had received training in Afghanistan whose guidance, the concept of the operation and funding, all of it came from Al-Qaeda in central Afghanistan. With a series of wars and political unrest in Afghanistan, it is difficult to chart an exact course for the future events. The victory of the Taliban, with the presence of black turbaned fighters who have been riding their trucks triumphantly into Kabul, represents the greatest unlikelihood of the Westerns abandoning the Afghan regime. The assistance of the security might be considered as the forefront of the Allied agenda, which would allow the withdrawal of some of the ISAF's combat forces. The reintegration of the Afghan citizens and the reconciliation with all of the Taliban might occur quite faster than the expectations of the Western powers. The history of the Afghanistan is replete with several examples wherein the entire armed factions have changed sides as per the recognition of the new realities. The regional actors and supporters like Pakistan and even Iran have played constructive roles in reaching the settlements or in the establishment of better peace. While the major outcomes of the war and political unrest are quite uncertain, there is the presence of a number of the key issues which needs to be tackled by the US leadership. Firstly, on the military end, it would be necessary to maintain the pressure on Taliban. The protection of the population should always remain the first priority. One of the best methods to achieve the same is by the elimination of the Taliban, the forces of which tend to oppress the population to a greater extent. The coalition seeks to safeguard the population, which is under great threat from the Taliban. If the reconciliation advances as planned include some of them in Pakistan and Afghanistan who will want to cut short the offensive operations and the activities of the counter-terrorist against the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In reality, the reconciliation would depend on, in the long run, on the destruction of the Taliban, the fracturing of the Taliban alliance and the convincing of the several commanders towards reconciliation. Secondly, it is quite clear that there is a great need to introduce the high-level teamwork of civil and military throughout the leadership of the United States in the country. Afghanistan and Iran have been the positive proofs that the personal commitments can remove the possible obstacles of cooperation. With as many as 1,000 U.S. government civilians in the country, there has been established an integration of the political military efforts at the regional brigade, national and district province level. The military and civil leaders at the brigade levels and at the regional command might lie ahead of the Washington and Kabul-based superiors in the forging of the government approach to the current problems in Afghanistan. On the third aspect, there are coalitions which need to not work harder but tends to be smarter on the problems of the narcotics. The taxes or the profits from the narcotics trade can be used to fund the Taliban and the corrupt government officials. The excessive drug use and its addiction are a growing problem in the region, including the Afghan National Security Forces as well. In response to this, the ISAF should increase its efforts against the drug lords, laboratories and the warehouses. When the infrastructure of the drug lords would be gone, its eradication will become easier and the crop substitution will have a better chance. 
The fourth concern could be the fact that the United States should develop a strong strategy for South Asia, which might help in the restoration of the appropriate priorities in the long run. There have been recommendations about paying great attention to the economic reforms and the political development in Pakistan, as well as the increased attention to building trust and relationships between Islamabad and New Delhi. Post-conflict, long-term relationships in South and Southwest Asia should be the priority for our strategic planners and diplomats. Peace between Pakistan and India is greatly important for the United States, as equivalent is the peace between Israel and its neighboring countries. The resolution of the conflicts in Afghanistan could be the first chain of peace in the region. Finally, the United States and its allies, including the international financial institutions, would need to focus on building the capacity of Afghanistan, not just on the short-term basis in the national security ministries, but also on the board in the private sectors and the civil governments. Advising and training Afghanistan security forces could be the important immediate steps, but we must think in terms of decades about helping Afghanistan in overcoming the effects of around 33 years of war. The Western countries must reinforce advisory efforts and training that would help the Afghan graduate schools and colleges to help in their modernization. While working more closely with district province and province is vital, it is also true that there is not going to be an end to the problems of Afghanistan unless there is a functioning government in Kabul that could be linked into the districts and provinces and by being able to perform the welfare functions and the basic security of the state. The nation-building notion in Afghanistan is in the interest of the United States and its coalition partners.